we could just quiet him down so everybody can hear that'd be bad. <laughs> so I'm Rob, I'm the membership development manager at the Students' Union. Now, unfortunately, one of the things I have to do is, is help the team manage risk. Lots of your groups are risky. Um, lots of things might happen and we have to manage all of that. And risk assessment and stuff can be pretty boring, right? It's like not the most exciting thing. Um, and we all actually might do it first. Like, I have no idea what risk assessment is, what it's about. It's hard. We have this thing about our oh, risk assessment really hard. Two things. Who in here is experienced in doing risk assessment? Pop your hand up if you think you are. Okay, a few people. Who here has ever skipped the lecture? Put your hand up. Okay, thoughts. Who here has ever crossed the road? So all of you, by both skipping a lecture and by crossing the road, of all risk assessed, you skipped the lecture, you went, right, what's the sort of consequence of that for me? And you might have gone, well, actually, today, the consequence isn't much. So you weighed up the risk of missing the lecture. The consequence wasn't that high, perhaps, so you decided to miss it. You've all crossed the road. Hopefully, you got across safely. So you made an assessment about how am I going to get across that road safely? And it actually wasn't that difficult for you to make those assessments. I bet you, you came pretty quickly to the conclusion that you can cross the road. I bet you also came pretty really quickly to the conclusion that I'm going to skip that lecture. And you did a risk assessment in your head really, really quickly. And when we're thinking about managing events and managing risks and all of that sort of stuff, it's not really any different. And what we don't want to do, we want your groups to happen safely. And risk assessment allows you to do things. So I'm going to go back to the thing where you skip the lecture. Your risk assessment allowed you to skip the lecture because ultimately on the balance, you went, well, you know, the consequence of this isn't that high for me. And that's what we want you to do with your groups. We want you to be able to do stuff, but we have to make judgments on things and sometimes put things in place which mitigate. Because when you skip that lecture, who went back and watched the lecture? Who asked a mate about the lecture? Who went? So you put a control in place to mitigate that risk of you missing the lecture. You didn't just go, I'm going to miss the lecture and do nothing. It's exactly the same with all of this stuff as well. So we don't want to overcomplicate it for you guys, but it's important that you have an understanding of it. That's what we're going to sort of talk about over the next 20 minutes, half an hour or so. And then we're also going to touch on planning and managing events as well, because we know that you come to us with lots of requests, um, often to Helen, um, to, for room bookings and booking all sorts of stuff. And we want to help you to, to manage events outside of your normal activities and give you some top tips and stuff like that. Hopefully my little, my little clicker doesn't work. Um, I don't want to click on here, then it's well. So there we go. So before, if you could sign in, by the way, actually, yeah, using that QR code, so I should have had that on screen a minute ago. So you So I just wanted to go through a few definitions with you of when we're looking at risk assessment. Again, just to break this down a bit and that it doesn't have to be uber complicated. So there's a few things that we might talk to you about when we when we talk about risk assessment. And we want you to be familiar with this language because it helps and it helps you and it helps us understand what you're trying to do. And there are a few key terms on here, which are risk, hazard, harm and reasonably practical and I should have probably control on here as well and if we're ever talking to you about risk we're talking to you about so risk is something which is the combination of the likelihood of something being harmed by something and actually the consequence that that's going to happen essentially it's that interaction between those two things so the likelihood and the consequence so I'll show you a little diagram on that which I'll hopefully just show it really clearly. So the likelihood you'd have along the bottom there. So if something's really likely to happen, so when you're crossing the road, 
is it really likely that you're going to um, experience some, some harm? And what's the consequence of that harm as well? And that's what the risk is. So we, we're never going to ask you to categorise risk in a number. We don't need to do that. But conceptually, it's good we see that. But what we're ultimately trying to do with risk assessment, if we think something's really highly likely to happen up here, and it's a high consequence, then we want to reduce the risk to down here. So that's what we're trying to do when we're doing risk assessment, essentially. Just to go back to that. So that's risk. Hazard, essentially, whenever we say hazard, you might as well think of something that can cause danger. It's basically something that can cause harm, whether it's chemicals, electricity, um, working from heights, driving, you know, um, it could be social harm as well. Like if you're undertaking a survey, you get abuse, for example, social harm. So that's a, that's a hazard and that harm, what do we get from that hazard? It cause injury or illness or ill feeling or a negative consequence, essentially. And so if on this sort of scale here, if we think something is really likely to cause harm and the consequence of that harm is like, is high, then we want to reduce it. But what we have to do is something we could need some control in place. But when we're looking at this, it has to be something sort of reasonably practicable. So weighing up the cost versus the benefit of that essentially. And that's what we're going to do with you. We're never going to ask you as groups to do something which isn't reasonably practicable. We're only going to do things that are sensible. It's common sense. Risk assessment is common sense essentially. And so when we're managing those risks, it's really, really simple. It's the key five steps, essentially. You identify the hazards. Now, I think if you could just like respect the other people in the room, so people are trying to listen, yeah? Um, so we identify the hazards. So you look at what's going to cause harm, essentially. Decide who might be harmed, like who and what. It might be equipment. We also might want to risk assess if there's going to be damage to our equipment. We don't want to do an activity that's going to cost our group loads of money because we damage our equipment by it. So we might need to risk a risk assessment in place to make sure we don't damage things as well. We evaluate that and identify the controls. And then the risk investment bit, the paperwork bit, is essentially just recording all of that. So record those findings and every now and again reviewing it. And I know that all of you would have received your paperwork from the opportunity team about your group specific risk assessment. So you would have reviewed that give them over summer check you're happy with it. Definitely have a look at that from time to time. You know, as we need this, you are responsible for making sure that your um, activity is run in a safe manner. And that's really important to realise. And the people that are in your groups, it's really important that they understand, not necessarily see your risk assessment, but if there's some key things in there, you need to make them aware because we need to make sure your group members that aren't on your committees, they know how to safely participate so that nobody else gets injured, nobody else gets harmed and stuff like that. So it's worth reviewing these things. But also if you're organising something different, this might be a new process that you go through to sort of risk assess an activity or the event. And just a few things to sort of demonstrate this in a really simple way. Again, I talked about this in the lecture, I talked about crossing the road. But Three sets of pictures on here. The, the, heart, the hazard here is the lion, risk of causing harm might be this. The control, well, it's simple, we just put a, a barrier with a in front. So we re reduce the likelihood in that, in that scenario. Here, set of rugby posts. That could be the hazard. You might knock your head on the rugby posts. You might not um, cause a broken bone. So what we've done, we put pads there. So we both decrease the likelihood that you're getting it getting an injury. We've also decreased the consequence. And if you hit a if you hit a pad, the likelihood is you're not going to get badly injured. And over here on the on the right hand side of the screen, that's obviously we've been through a pandemic recently. Um, there were if you had a vaccination, that was a control that was put in place essentially to decrease the likelihood of you both uh, decrease the likelihood of you getting. COVID, but also to hopefully decrease the consequence if you did get it as well. So it's happening both the likelihood and the consequence. And here, talked about crossing the road already. 
you might have decided to cross the road using a pedestrian crossing. So you decrease the likelihood of a car not stopping when you're crossing the road. Relevant to some of our groups, so the climber here, climbing without a helmet, hazard could be falling rocks and land on the climber's head, that could cause an obviously traumatic head injury. It's an easy control. One could be all of our um, people that climb, if they're out of the crag, they wear a helmet and that could um, decrease the consequence. So you won't necessarily decrease the likelihood, and that's the thing with risk assessment. We can't always control everything. So in that case, here with the climber, not to decrease the likelihood of a rock fall, because that would happen whether the uh, world health or not, but we decrease the consequences of that if it does happen. So we're not trying to stop the activity happening at all. And the simple one here, just sometimes simple as putting a sign up which says, be careful to other people. Because I guess we can't always assume common sense with our people. Someone might go up to a tea and give it a hug. Um, if we had a hot sign on that, then we could always go, well, you're doing it yourself, and really that was your fault because it was a nice hot sign, proportion hot sign. And this translated into what we want you to do. Again, it's really simple. Um, hopefully, this type of form that we use is relatively simple. We're not asking you to number things because it's quite arbitrary when you do assign a number to things, because I might go, oh, well, this is a risk 23, and you might go, oh, well, this is a risk 21. Do we really get a toss it for 21 or 23? Not really. Um, what we want to do is make sure there's a control in place to control that risk if we need to. So it's as simple as what are the hazards? Go back to the rugby post ones. During a game or training, people might collide with the posts, cause head injury, etc. Who's at risk for anyone playing? Controls, the pads, and who, what are further controls? Well, the group organizer within each session to ensure the pads are um, installed there, basically. The falling rocks one from the track. Well, any falling rock, as I said, cause the injury to the person. What are controls? Well, the club has climbing helmets, which are inspected each year. Um, all members are briefed that they must wear them whilst being laid and climbing. Nobody's allowed to participate without using them. And de damaged helmets are retired if they got rid of them. That needs to be this like thing we say. And then further controls, we ensure that they're inspected each year. The group leaders do some bits, so such as brief those that the crags wear helmets, monitor the use of helmets, and report damages of helmets. So again, we don't have to spend lots of time putting that together, but what is really vital is that we do those steps. So if we say that group leaders are to report damage to helmets at the SU, that needs to be done. So that's why we need to be aware of what's in our risk assessment, because that's really crucial, because if we don't do that, someone wears a damaged helmet, that impacts the safety of the of the activity. And the tiering, a similar process, again, just putting in our controls and further controls. So hopefully that demonstrates that risk assessment doesn't have to be super complicated, it doesn't have to be super hard. Um, it is generally common sense, but you just need to think about things sometimes a bit further. What could cause somebody essentially to injure themselves? And that's what ultimately we think of the risk assessment. And that understanding that you as group leaders have a responsibility for making sure that your activities are safe, and that's really important for you guys to understand essentially. So has anyone got any questions so far? So as I said before, uh, you've got your risk assessments for your regular training and stuff like that. That's fine. If you see that those risk assessments aren't fit for purpose, or you notice that you do something within your training sessions, within your group activities, within your society meetups that are different, you need to let us know straight away because the team can work with you to update your risk assessments. And don't shy away from that because just because you're doing something different doesn't mean that you can't do it. We just need to make sure that's recorded. Um, that's really important because if something, the danger is that if you're doing something different and an incident does happen, that's when you get into trouble and we go, oh, can the group do that? And the university might come to us and go, well, the group are doing this and the risk assessment didn't say it. And that's where we get into more bother. But if the risk assessment covers it and there's an incident, that's where we're protected for, as an SU, 
you guys and our activities can carry on because it, risk assessment doesn't mean there's not going to be an incident. It just means hopefully most of our incidents aren't going to be catastrophic, essentially. So always um, complete your risk assessment forms and review them. If you're doing something different, submit those risk assessments to us and we can just check and brief on you um, and ask for support. We are never going to say um, categorically can't do this. What we will do is work with you. If there's a massively high risk of something, we will work with you to bring that risk level down as soon as we can do it. We're not a no student student, we're absolutely not. Um, and yet, when I say risk assessment should be shared to all members, that's not those bits of paper necessarily, because like, who's going to be here? But I think it's making sure that if there's some key parts, that your members are aware of how they should behave in those activities. I'll go back to the climbing one. If there's specific things that they need to do to safely be fine, you need to make sure um, your other members are aware of that, essentially. And obviously, there's some groups that that's more relevant to than others because we do have within our groups, we have higher risk groups than others. So that's me on the risk assessment. Hopefully, that didn't bore you too much. And we're only at 20 past five, so we're all good. And the graveyard shift is slowly but surely getting smaller. So, you know. so, what we also wanted to talk to you about was managing events, because what we've noticed over the last few years is um, something great, really, is that groups, club society, volunteering projects, you want to put on more and more stuff, which is brilliant because we won't need to be putting on extra stuff. But what that comes with is you guys being managers, project managers, project leaders, essentially, that have to manage quite sometimes quite complex events and projects. Um, so when you, if you're wanting to put extra stuff on, we want you to sort of be kitted out to be able to do that and to do what you need to think about. Some of you might be like, oh, well, yeah, this is all obvious stuff. But some of you, this might spear like some thinking, I guess. So make sure you always have somebody that ultimately in charge of your event. Because if that doesn't happen, you often go, well, yes, that point, oh, well, they were supposed to book the chairs, and I thought you were going to do it, and nobody did it, and then we haven't got any chairs. So always make sure there's somebody in charge. What's the purpose of your event? Like, why are you doing it? It's always good to look for that. Checklists, you know, but have a task list, have a jobs list. Make sure that all of that's recorded. And just because you're the event lead or the event manager, doesn't mean you have to do all the doing. But what you might do in that role is do a lot of the monitoring. So I'm the membership development manager. I don't do all the doing, but I have I might have a big list of things that our team needs to do. And I monitor that. And as three leaders, that's what you're going to do. If you're planning an event, you might have a team of people delivering tasks on the ground. But make sure you're monitoring it. So when it comes to event day, all the things are ticked off and um, they run nice and smoothly. Also, who do you need to let know? Who are your stakeholders? Is that the uni? Is that security? Is that a venue? Is that us in the SU? Is that Helen, who we're going to book a room with? And Helen's going to speak to you in a minute about um, some of this stuff as well. So think about who all the stakeholders are. <laughs> Money. It's a thing, isn't it? Who, who's going to budget it? You need to make sure that that's at the forefront of your planning as well. Because if you don't think about money, you might get a big bill. Um, who's going to put the bill? The student union can't always put the bill, you know, unfortunately. Um, rooms, transport, and finally, risk assessment. It's just evaluate those, evaluate those risks. So if you're ticking off all those things when you're thinking about events, you're in a really good place to deliver an event. Um, and it, it'll happen nice and smoothly rather than rushing around. Um, and last minute panics and stuff. And have documents that have things like so activities, tasks, the who, the notes, the deadlines, have those type of things. And set milestones, meet with your teams regularly if you've got a team of people working on this stuff. Um, and define those key people. Use Microsoft Teams because if you have shared documents, so if you've got an event planner, have everybody in your like the best planning group sharing that document so you can see live updates of where you're up to. Simple things um, like like that, sort of form essentially in Microsoft Teams. It's just super easy um, to use. All it is is the activity task who people can have notes to and when you get one. And if you're doing a task, you could update where you're up to on that task, but you could ask the other people 
whom you've delegated jobs to, to make sure they fill out the notes section. So when you look at it, you've got assurance that this is all going smoothly and if people haven't filled it in, you can follow them up. So it's just those little bits of best practice, essentially, that we want you to be able to do. And what that does as well is make sure that we as an SU can support you well, because if you come to us for support on an event, we can say, oh, what are the, what do you want to do? What are your tasks? How are you managing it so far? And we can look at this with you and go, okay, you're having problems with this area. That's the bit we want to support. You. So all this is about building support for you guys. And some key parts, again, these are just based on um, our experiences over the last sort of few years, really, is that if you're doing a small scale event, you want to think about three, three weeks notice in terms of booking things, doing project plans, if this is really small, um, completing risk assessments, project plans and stuff. But if it's a large event, you need to be thinking in the months realm. So if you're looking at a large scale event, give yourself time because we've all got busy lives. This isn't the only thing you do. So you, you'll need to factor this into your own business as well. And then something we just want to draw your attention to is food because this always comes up when people ask us lots of questions about it. If you're doing bake sales and things like that, actually know a lot of you do those type of things, but make sure you name all the ingredients on your on cakes and your foods if you've got baked, baking type things. Only put serve food that can be served at room temperature. Don't serve it if it needs to be consumed um, needs to be kept chilled or frozen. Um, and obviously transport and see all the containers. If you're looking to do things over and above that there, for example, a barbecue, what our risk assessment says is that someone in charge of that activity needs to have a food hygiene certificate. They're actually not that challenging to get. It's just an online course, um, really easy to get. You can fund that through um, your group of accounts as well, if you're going to put some members through that. And it'll get you, entry. you don't have to attend the course, it's all online. But what we would do is if you are coming to say, you want to do an event based on, on doing a bit more about food, then you do need to look at that. It's not a challenging thing to do, but um, for the health and safety of people participating, that's what we're going to do. Cool. So we're nearly done. And what I wanted to do now is I, I'm going to click a link and I'm going to hand over to Helen. Because what Helen's, um, Helen, you might know her. Helen's behind me here. Helen is our uh, membership that's administrator. A lot of the booking you do come through to Helen. And Helen has a really challenging job because <laughs> Helen receives God knows how many emails a day and God knows how many e Room bookings she has to juggle it, with limited space across the university essentially. Um, it's basically like putting a puddle together. It's really challenging. So when we get extra things, that can pose us challenges because you know, room bookings in are a high demand. We don't always have the luxury of like saying, yes, you can have PL5 on a Wednesday at half five. Sorry, but Gary. So Helen's produced a template event planner that might help you when you're sort of looking at planning events and help Helen in terms of her booking things and what she needs to know from you. So I'm going to click this link and go to that and Helen can works. talk you through it. Can you can you hear me with that microphone? Yes. There's a surprise. Uh, <laughs> right, so I've worked for the Student Union for the past year um, with all of you lovely people. Um, and when groups put on larger, uh, more kind of complex events, um, we're finding that there are certain challenges they come up against. Um, and some may have organised an event and forgotten to do something. And then I get a panicked phone call or a panicked email at three o'clock on a Friday saying, can we please have this for tomorrow? And it's sometimes it's just not practical. So uh, with that in mind, I have developed this. So you can use it for any event you want to do. Um, it's you can amend like all the bits in green. So these are just general things. You can change them to, to fit your criteria. Uh, first thing is first though, booking rooms. You are going to be sick and tired of maybe talking about booking rooms by the end of the year, I can assure you. It is an enormous jigsaw puzzle, as Ron said. 
Um, but please, just a quick reminder, ongoing, you do require the room, please do it at least seven days in advance, if not before, because it makes my job an awful lot easier. Anyway, so when we start talking about bigger events, a lot of you will want to put stuff on in November, December, might want January, January showcases, end of year stuff so in sort of April, May time. This is when this really does come in handy. So I've divided it into three separate bits. So beforehand, so like a month in advance, two weeks in advance, day of the event. Again, you can add more bits if you want to, or take bits out. This is just guidance more than anything else for you. Okay, so then, hey. Yeah, look wrong. at that. I can't, I'll change though, can I? No, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> you can change these. So yeah, there will be bits and pieces that you can do. Um, um, in like the, the previous weeks and stuff. Okay, so first is first, look at the room. You want the big rooms, PL2, PL5, PJ Hall, they will be giving things. Powers, uh, JP Hall, Bridefell, Moles. I think that's it. Then big capacity rooms, please get in as quickly as you can because they do mix maps up quite quickly. Um, so once you've done that, you've kind of gone, oh, these two entertainers. You could tick these off, by the way, as well. Should be able to. Hey, so you can share this document with everybody in your teams. If you, there is a link, uh, but if you cannot, for whatever reason, download it, let me know it and I'll send you a hard copy across, which you can then upload to your teams. Okay, so you want people to go to your event, don't you? <laughs> Yay! We want people to have fun and enjoy themselves, don't we? Yeah. Oh, come on. Like, I'm sorry to say, the other thing's not Friday. Um, so, again, I put in a bit about social media and ticket creation. Everyone's on TikTok. I hate it. Personally, I don't like TikTok. So, you've got TikTok, you've got Snapchat, you've got Facebook, you've got Instagram. So, anything that you want to. Um, any ticket creation will be done on native um, and any like social media stuff is in the house. You do what it is that you want to do. You can contact marketing. It's just to the door. Says, if you want us to write it on the bank of. Uh, and then we, we need a few bits and pieces for our event. So, so if we go down a little bit, there you go. Thanks, Rob. I've broken them down into categories. So you can kind of see what it is you're spending and on what you're spending it on. Is that, that makes sense? And we're not talking hot tubs or city rooms or anything like that, but if we go to venue hire, there we go, equipment hire. Hey, see, it's really colourful. So you can see exactly how we're like, so we've got an imaginary budget of £2,000. <laughs> Up, is it? So if we go down and we spend, yeah, another, there we go, thanks for keep going. So if we spend £150 on food, oh, there is 70, oh, there. and then if we go back up, can you see, it's all starting to break down for you, so you can see pictorially exactly what you've got left as well, because it gives you a difference because you're running touch at the bottom. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Okay, so as I said, it's all broken down. So as you amend all of these different things, value is changed at the top. And then we've got a bit at the bottom, with, which is miscellaneous. So then you see percentages and results. And then you can just add in your own bits. Then maybe other bits and pieces you need to add in as well that I've forgotten about. But this is just a guide to obviously give you some kind of structure as to your event planning. Is that all right? Is that really handy? Yeah. Cool. I think we need to finish up. Yeah, we are. Thank you very much, Helen. So, <laughs> yeah. Please, yes. And I've got one last plug, which is totally unrelated to this, um, this talk. So, as a student union, 
we're always looking to get students involved in stuff. And I know that Nye at the beginning of the day talked about talk to her if you think changes can be made at the university. And we're actually starting a project with the university, which is going to be called Students as Consultants. Now, this hasn't happened yet. But what the uni actually want to do, which is really good, is youth students as consultants more and also probably pay you for those roles as well. And what they want, what we want to help them develop is a framework which allows them. So say, for example, um, the estate team said, we're going to build a huge pub for the student team. They might want students involved in planning that with them. Um, the university might go, we want to deliver some different catering ideas on them. Um, campus, but they want a student consulting group to work with them on that. It might be they want to invest in the sports infrastructure, but what we might say again is you need to do the students as consultants bit because we need students involved in this on the panel that makes the decision that looks at the budget to such the whole thing. And so what they're developing is a framework. We're going to develop a framework which is called students as consultants, which basically means that when the university say we're going to be doing this. We say to them, ah, for this project, you should use the students as consultants framework. It makes it really easy for us to make the university consult students. If you go, well, you need to consult students if this students and consultants framework, this is how you use them. Um, but we need to build that for the uni, what that's going to look like, because it's a toolkit essentially. And we've got um, a workshop next Wednesday, 10 till 12, um, with an external consultant. She's very, very good. And um, if any of you did, um, what's the training master of so to speak? Oh, like resilience, was it? Look at that one. Good. What's the such? She's very good. So she's going to need to tell us to build this framework with the units, but we need students to come along to basically go, right, this is what we think how the, student, how the university should be listening to students. So if you're interested in coming along, um, then scan that QR code, it's a sign up form. There will be um, the, the classic chocolate brownies as well there. So we'll have a chicken over the chocolate brownie. Oh, I, th I think that's <laughs> <it's laughs> <it's laughs> I think that sounds well. Sam's a liar because we never booked brownies for today. So I would take that directly to Sam. Um, and on his head be it. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but there are definitely brownies next week. And if there are, on my head for you, okay, I'll take full <laughs> responsibility for that. And, uh, yeah. so, but if you are interested in getting involved, um, yeah, um, just give that a <laughs> chance. Just quickly, one element was how this has worked. Last year, a lot of students made a lot of complaints about how the mental health service was and how easy that was to access. And from that, the university used students as consultants in a whole consultation with them to create a new strategy, a new action plan. That they're going to implement over this year, but hopefully improve that services to how students want it to be rather than how the universities want it to be. So it's going to be based off that framework and it does work because we've seen a lot of improvements over the last year with that as well. And also another plus, we've got um, a how to improve and protect your mental health and session on those. When's that? Tuesday, the 10th of October. So, if you want to attend that session, it's on our event portal online on the website. So, just go to our event portal on the SU website. And if you want to sign up to that as an online session, it's completely free. So, it's absolutely free. And yes, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, done. Hey!